after. Now they're going to school for real. All they did was play with the background. I got so sick of it. It's, it's so cool, but actually it's really stupid. So uh, they did not listen to the teacher at all. They were just playing around with the background. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. So we are live. Yes. Nenina, vocês podem conferir, está tudo certo? Estamos. Bom, gente, boa tarde a todos. É um prazer enorme, né? Estamos chegando ao final do Femiclare e como cereja do bolo, a gente tem essa participação especialíssima dessa super presença feminina no instrumento, é, eu tenho muita, né, eu estou muito feliz em poder dizer que eu estou hoje aqui, essa tarde, como uma das maiores referências no instrumento, sou muito fã do trabalho dela há muito tempo, e, bom, eu acho que, que, que ela dispensa comentários, né, eu não preciso ficar aqui lendo o currículo da da, da Sharon para vocês, mas tem uma observação especial que eu queria fazer. Em 2013, ela gravou aquele CD ópera, no qual ela tocou várias áreas, né? não sei se vocês conhecem, o, o disco está disponível no Spotify, recomendo. E, e eu só estou citando esse CD em especial, porque hoje a conversa é sobre esses paralelos que podem ser estabelecidos entre o canto e o clarinete. Então, antes da gente começar, eu vou chamar a nossa querida colega Clara, que ela já está quase se despedindo né, da gente. Um, então, vamos lá. também para ajudar vocês com algumas informações importantes. Então vamos lá? Eu sei que dá vontade de aproveitar o chat do Zoom para conversar com aquele colega de longa data. Nós vamos deixar apenas para perguntas, ok? Ah, é bom dar aqui comentários inadequados. Não serão aceitos por aqui. E deixa os microfones. Você pode participar das atividades pelo Zoom ou pelo nosso canal no YouTube. Lembrando que pelo Zoom fica mais fácil a nossa interação. Mas tenha consciência que sua imagem está sendo vinculada ao vivo na internet. Então, se você não está de acordo com isso, ele é muito gentil. Importante. Tirem fotos, selfies, marquem a gente, registrem tudo e abusem da hashtag Femiclare2020. Nos vemos por aí. Bom, é isso. Muito obrigada, Clara. Gente, só mais um recado importante. É, essa atividade vai ser em inglês e quem tiver com alguma dificuldade de entender, vocês podem acionar o Closed Caption aí no, na página principal do Zoom. É, essa legenda não é uma legenda automática, a Ariane vai estar responsável pelas legendas, ela vai estar aqui ajudando. Claro que não vai dar para traduzir tudo, mas ela vai tentar ir, é, à medida do, na medida do possível esclarecendo aí os assuntos que estão sendo abordados. Bom, então é isso. Chega de enrolar. Welcome to Brazil, Sharon Khan. The microphone is... Hi. I hope um, I don't sound like an avatar video before, which was going... <laughs> um, 
So <laughs> I am looking at few faces and many red microphones and names. I hope uh, everybody can understand me. And please, I have the chat open. So maybe if there's some technical problems, you can write and say, please speak slower. Please speak quicker. We didn't get the video or whatever. Um, as I heard that this is going to be happening online and that I sh maybe should be speaking for a while here, I was thinking, um, what should I speak about? What haven't you heard before? What is interesting and maybe what is personal for me? What is something that is important for me, especially um, in clarinet playing and maybe what makes me who I am or what is making me develop on in my career, what's the thread through all my developments in my life. And um, I realized that actually, I think um, for me, the most important thing altogether is to have the feeling whoever is standing in front of me with whatever instrument are singing to me, are taking their body and prolonging it with an instrument. So for us, it's over here, for a violin, it's over here, and for a pianist, it's over here. But in any case, we are trying basically to sing through our instruments. And I know today we have all these extreme techniques that are so interesting. Everybody's going on YouTube, especially the kids. Look, he can play so fast, and look, he can play so long, and she can, I don't know what, uh, do whatever, and, and stand on the head and play at the same time, and whatever. But all this stuff is, is very interesting and very, especially for clarinet players, you can dig into what's out there and who can do what. But at the end of the day, when you go to a concert, you want to take something with you back home. And you know our listeners are not instrumentalists and very often mostly not musicians. So they're coming to our concerts, well, whatever are left of them at the moment, but they're coming to our concerts to take some emotions back home with them and to maybe chew on them and live off them for a while until the next emotional thing comes along because we are dealing with emotions all the time, but not all people have this opportunity to actually constantly see, what do I feel? How do I express myself? How do I spread it around to the world and whatever? And how do we express these feelings? I don't think definitely not through playing faster and triple tonguing and circular breathing and I don't know what, but through actually being able to create music through our instrument. And I realized that very early in my life, I had a fantastic teacher, not just clarinet teacher, especially this teacher who I'm talking about was the concert master violinist of Israel Philharmonic. And um, at the minute that I had enough money, <laughs> it, he was very expensive. <laughs> um, I went to him maybe every two weeks or three weeks. And I went through all the repertoire of the clarinet with him in the eyes of a musician, not in the eyes of a clarinetist. And he has always talked about the voice, about the distance between the notes and how watching the notes going up and down the page, these little black dots on the page, watching them going up and down should give us the proportions of a phrase. Because if you know a human voice, they scream when they go up and they have nothing on the bottom. Of course, this is not true for a very good singer, but this is true for the natural voice of a human being. We raise our voice to scream and we put our voice down to sit to be very soft. So this is what happens when you have a phrase. La, da, di, da, 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 ti, dum, ti, dum, ti, da. It's natural. This is what is natural. And this is what we are all looking for. Every time we open a piece of music, how do we sound like it's natural? It sounds natural when we are imitating the voice, when we're imitating the human voice. And the human voice is, of course, something that the, a singer is trying to get over and be as fantastic as an instrumentalist. So we are always trying to imitate each other. This is the one thing that has been part of my musical education since I was very little. And the other thing is 
this constant strive for legato, legatissimo, just to try to make one tone really blend into the next one. And I remember this violin teacher says, I don't know to 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 how you do it, but I want a legato. He always said it. I don't know to to to. Like to 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 is what we do. Is what we do really? This is what we sound like to 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 with a wind instrument. I always felt like I had to prove to him, no, we're not about to to to. We're about hua. And this was. I went back home and said, I don't want to sound like to to to. I want to sound like like a beautiful violin or a fantastic voice. And he always tried to make me do things that actually I thought from what I heard around me and what I saw around me are probably not really possible on a clarinet. It's just a clarinet, so you should not try to get you know, this out of it. But yes, why should a clarinet Brahms sonata sound any worse than a fantastic Brahms violin sonata, right? I mean, it's the same composer. So we should strive to be as fantastic and as emotional, and as creative as a violinist or a cellist would be on their own instruments. This is something that I remember really bothering me, really making me think and, and try to get out of the box, out of the abilities of my instrument, uh, to make, to be better than, than my instrument, to, to create something more than possible on my instrument. This is something that I, I really think I was very lucky to have this person sort of looking over my shoulder and not saying, yes, I know it's difficult on the clarinet, but maybe try. No, he had no idea what was difficult on the clarinet. He just said, you should do it. And I don't care to do how you do it. <laughs> so this was, I was very lucky. The other thing that I was very lucky to find was my husband. My husband is a, an opera conductor. My daughter is a percussionist. So if you're hearing boom, boom, it's she, she's making noises outside. Um, and I got married to my husband. I was 23 years old. And I got married a little bit also to the opera world by getting married to him and him, basically his other wife was the opera house. And uh, I spent many, 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 many evenings just watching this world, this amazing world of the opera and watching singers sing and see how they, they create music and create moments and drama and everything with their bodies and with their voices and how they can fascinate us like no musician can do. No other genre and music can fascinate you so as a singer can, especially this is how I feel. But I think this is uh, true. And I was teaching some children last week and I was trying to find out how can I tell them what do we want to do with our second beautiful movement of Mozart concerto? How do we try to create something fantastic when we are basically so busy with this concerto, which we are always afraid of since we're very little and this movement where everybody says is like from coming from the sky, which doesn't make it any easier or better to play if you're constantly feeling the pressure of, you know, oh, you have to play it as if the, the sky is coming down and looking at you. How do we find a solution to sort of release ourselves from this and just say, it's just music and it's beautiful music. And if we just think the right things, it will just come out of us and everybody will be happy. I think I, I brought a video example of Kathleen Battle when she was very, very young. Kathleen Battle is a fantastic soprano, um, really, really world famous. And, um, she was very young in this video. Um, this is uh, um, uh, a, a, a beautiful uh, um, part of uh, a Susanna Aya from, um, uh, what is it, um, Cosi Fantuti? What is it? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not, I don't have my, da, 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 da. just wait a second. So, okay. Uh, sorry, Marriage of Figaro. I'm sorry, I'm just completely out of my, my range. So this is Susanna singing in the marriage of Figaro. And um, she is a young woman, very young woman. And she's wanting to get married. And she's singing about her happiness and how fantastic her life is. And the Graf is standing on the side. He's trying to persuade her not to be so great and not to be so 
young and, and honest, but to have a fling with him on the side quickly before she gets married. And he's the boss of the house. He can make her do what he wants. And he just finds her singing about her beautiful love and about how she's going to get married and be the happiest woman on earth. And it, it's painful for him to hear this uh, young woman and, and her honesty in life and, and knowing that he wants to ruin it as he's trying to ruin it. And what is so capturing, not only in this figure, in this place, in the opera, but also Miss Battle and her way of making this unbelievable legato sound like it's no problem at all. And if you see how she manages to take her body and use it to make this um, movement between one tone and the other, She's changing her body and then getting the note and then changing and then getting the note. And this is something that singers have to do because they have many instruments like us. We have to move from one register to the other. We have to prepare. But first we have to have an imagination. What is the gato? And I think if you see her singing, you might be able to understand in the body what we have to do to get from one note to the other. Maybe we watch it. Well, I don't know, the, the audio was better than the video on my side of the world. I'm far away from you, but I'm not quite sure. Was the audio okay for you guys? Could you hear it or was it? Okay, especially talking about legato and having digital <laughs> disturbance in between is not really great, but was still some of the legato available to see? I can send you all the links in case somebody's interested in listening to it, uh, I'll put it on in the uh, in the message. Sharon, I can put the links. Okay, then I'll leave it. I took it out. Um, yeah. So you see, in a way, our second movement of our Mozart concerto is not a tragic movement, and whatever. It's beautiful, but it's so unbelievable that when 
when really it really happens in a concert. You, you see people doing this, yeah? They just go, oh, yes, just like crying in a wedding. Yeah? You're crying because you're happy. You're so full of emotions that you don't know what to do with them. So they come out of your eyes, you know? And this, this um, aria does that to you. It is so pure and so beautiful. But of course, only when the legato is sung this way, it can be just an aria which you don't even care about in the opera. You just look in your program or read the subtitles or whatever, and you miss it. And if somebody sings it like this, you're like, yeah. So you have the opportunity to, to use this part of the fantastic instrument that we have I don't think an oboe can at all play as legato and as close to the human voice as we can. And this is something that is so part of the clarinet playing. And if you don't use this tool, you are basically throwing emotions that can be made just away and wasting your audience's time and ears and um, concentration instead of really using it and saying, okay, let me show you what I can do. And it's maybe so much more important than the most quick staccato or the most quick fingers is this legato, which is just as hard to really, really master. But it's possible and it's something that the clarinet can do much, much better than any other instrument, like a flute who can triple staccato with no problem at all. But this legato is something that we own, we should own. Um, Okay, I, I brought in, uh, of course, this is Mozart, right? And Mozart is where the clarinet starts. And this sliding from one tone to another is something we can't really think about when we play Mozart, because then we get all cheesy and romantic. And um, then somebody would say, yes, it was very beautiful, but it's out of style, right? We cannot be out of style when we play Mozart. It still has to sound like a young woman just singing there and just opening her mouth and the beauty comes out. There's, she doesn't need to do anything. It's just there, right? Sure. Let's not tell anybody that it's not that way, but this is how it should be looking. What happens when we play Brahms or Schumann? or Reger, or I don't know, anything a little bit further down the road, something from the Romantic period. Then we have a different thinking about legato, which has this potato, this movement from one note to the other, which is in a voice, of course, also a little bit of sliding in a, in a string player, a little bit of sliding. And this we cannot do on the clarinet. If we do it, we become a klezma clarinetist or something like that. But we still have to think about it. We still have to feel like we are sliding down. We're putting one finger after the other. We're almost making a glissando without actually making a glissando in order for this legato to really, really be chewy and romantic and painful almost. And in order to show you uh, something that is maybe a little bit more a romantic way of making a legato. I chose one of my most beloved um, videos of all times. And um, this is from Rosenkavalier, this that's it, uh, in, in the end of the piece, where uh, the Marceline, who is so old, I think she's 30 something, right? <laughs> she is basically giving her lover, which is the woman in the pants, the, the pants, of a, a woman playing a man, um, to his new love, basically saying, I am too old for him. And he needs to be now with a young woman that is as old as, she, as him. And I am now just old and I need to free him if I love him. And this is, of course, a woman who is in a very different stage of her life. And she has wisdom, she has knowledge, and she has a very big heart, but she's really in pain. And this Rosen Cavalier Aya is one of the most unbelievable places. I, of course, only playing part of it. It's a little bit stupid, but it may be something, especially this particular one. And Barbara Bonny is singing, is singing the, the young girl, and, and this is Kiri Kanawa singing um, the Marshallin, and it's one of the most unbelievable, I think, Metropolitan Opera um, film from, from this opera. So you can watch it if you like in full, but 
not while we are doing the, the, the talking now. Internet overload. Paula! We lost her. Sorry, <laughs> it stopped. No, wait, wait. I will try to continue. Yeah, it's the, the, it's stopping all the way. It's okay. We, we just let it be. And I mean, I think really, seriously, if anybody wants, I'll give you my email, ask questions, but it's probably better everybody watches it when we're not live talking here, because this is one of those things that you really maybe need to be alone in a dark room to really, really enjoy. But you see this, this sliding down from one tone to the other, like walking in water. This is something that is different than playing just Mozart, which is maybe not so deep waters when you're walking. And that is a different kind of legato. And this kind of legato is also a, a technique that, that we have to learn. And a voice would not even be talking on notes. They will be talking on notes and continuing the vo vocals until the next consonant. And this is something that we really have to try to do when we play an instrument, although we have a tube in our mouth and we can't really talk. I think this is something that is very important that we just somehow observe this way of making music from the singers who have the speech, have the other dimension. They can really say something, right? We can't really say something. We're always stuck behind a mouthpiece, but it's possible. It's possible to talk through an instrument. If you really, really try, think about a baby who doesn't even have speech yet, but you still understand what they want to tell you, right? If you really know them, you can really know if they want to eat or sleep or the diaper is full. You really can see it on their faces and you can hear it on the different emotions that, that how they cry or whatever. You can actually produce emotions without words. And this is a very, very important uh, side of our music making on an instrument. The other thing which I really, really wanted to talk about um, and also is not really being taken care of, even in the very, very high level of playing is breathing. Well, nobody needs to breathe anymore, right? You can circular breathe, so why breathe? Why talk about breathing? It's passé. Well, I brought a clip now and I'm, I hope it will work. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we will see if it works. Um, I mean, I, Paula, if you rather, I can try and share it and see. I don't know if it's, is it your internet that is slow or is it just the, the, the YouTube which is going on at the same time? I don't know. Uh, you decide. I'm ready. I can try. Maybe if it's not working, you can try to share. Okay. 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 Well, anyway, this is. Um, Peter Schreier and Schreier, if you um, say Schreier in Germany, it says the screamer. So it's Peter the screamer, um, very, very, very famous leader, singer, uh, singing uh, leader, especially in German language. And um, this here is Schumann, Du bist wie eine Blume, you are like 
a flower. And um, I really ask you when you're listening, it's very, very short, I think it's three minutes. Try to think about when does he breathe and when does he not breathe? Uh, you can stop it at the end. I think there, there is more than this Schumann lead on, on this track. Um, so maybe try to stop. And then I will try to show you two phrases and how he does them differently and all with his breathing. Yes, Rudolf Buchbinder, which I didn't say, he's fantastic, the pianist. <laughs> I'm hearing nothing. I don't know. I'm hearing your very chopped up yeah. music. I will start. So I will make you co host and then yes. you try to share. I try. Okay. Okay. Let me open it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, back to Zoom. Am I host now? Do you have, do I have to? Ah, don't start. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not really great at Zooming. I'm also learning. I need to be a host though in order to be able to share. Ah, I can. I see the green button. Okay. Now, I don't know how to make it a whole screen, but it doesn't really matter. It's not sound. Cheryl, you have yes. to share also the, the computer audio, otherwise it doesn't work. Sorry. Before share, left side. Shadow, can you hear me? Oh, Paulo, você não quer enviar yeah, para mim o link? Renata, só um yeah, minutinho. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deixa... Night, stop, bitte. Okay. <laughs> I have can to unshare, me? but I don't have the screen to unshare it. That is Why the problem. No? Okay. Um, I can see all the faces and I can see the shared screen but I can't see the place where I, <laughs> oh, stop, please. Thank you. And it's always starting the singing without me doing anything. It, so I will give the link to Ariane and she's going to share it, okay? Thank you, because the Zoom <laughs> that I have on my desktop is since three days new and it's all different than the one before, so I can't do anything. But I have to stop the sharing, but I can't, I can't do it because I don't have the window who, which allows me to do it. I don't know. You know, post. Yes, ah, okay. got it. Got it. This is not a new share. Ah, look, now I can do the, sound, the computer sound. Okay. I can do it. I can Perfect. do it. Perfect. Let's see if it works now. I know. Ich schau die 
mich an und Wehmut schleicht mir ins Herz hinein. Mir ist, als ob ich die Hände aufs Haupt dir legen sollt. Bietend, dass Gott dich erhalte, so rein und schön. Okay, now you hear it probably through my headphones and through the computer, I should put myself on mute, but anyway, we'll do it again. Um, so you see, this is a very, very short thing, like our Schumann fantasy piece number one or something. You have a, a short time and to um, express yourself. And of course, as I talked about legato being very important, but also when you breathe and how you breathe and when you don't breathe, has a very, very strong influence on our emotions. And so I will try to play you these two phrases. And you can see in the first phrase, he breathes just normally. When he does this phrase again, he doesn't breathe. And we have a feeling of this enormous tension and we don't know why, especially if we are not uh, musicians or not breathing musicians, even a violinist might not recognize this. We think, how is it possible that this phrase, which we heard a second ago and is very simple, why is it doing this to us? Because he does not breathe. And so if we never breathe and we never think about breathing, well, how are we going to create this emotion? After a while, the audience realizes we're circular breathing, so they don't care about our breathing anymore because we don't have to breathe. So that's put aside. And I really, dislike that feeling of not being able to control my audiences with this, oh, how come she never breathes? Or, oh, oh, she's breathing all the time, so she must be very, very, very emotional. This, we lack this completely the minute we stop breathing. Okay, anyway, now we have to ah, get rid of this uh, window, which I, again, don't know how to, ah, pause, share. Is the window gone now? Can you still see it? No, it's okay. Okay. No, should I close it? Ah, you see, it's me and my, okay. What about now? Is it gone? Yes. <laughs> Quit, that's a good thing to do. All right, so I'm, this was something that was on my heart and I, I thought maybe it might be a good idea to, to share this with you and to um, see, perhaps some people say, oh, this old fashioned lady that's gone, that's passé. Now we are, our issues are different issues. And maybe some of you say, oh, thank you. I, I, I really thought I have to now learn how to triple staccato and circular breathe to be in. Well, I don't believe in this stuff and I'm still around until they kill me. I'm still up there on the stage trying to create emotions with very old fashioned tools. And I just wanted to, to tell you that this is for me still the most valid, important stuff to practice every day. Okay, well, um, I was told that you might have questions and I should leave some time for questions. And um, 
yeah, I don't know in which language they might be or if you want to write them down, I have to make sure that I'm reading all that stuff that's happening there on my right side, um, as you wish. So let's go. Um, alguém tem perguntas preparadas? Ela disse que basicamente era isso que ela tinha preparado para falar. Então, ela disse que não consegue acompanhar o chat, não sabe exatamente a língua que vai vir a pergunta. Eu também não estava acompanhando aqui 100%. Mas se alguém quiser desmutar o microfone para perguntar alguma coisa também, fica à vontade. A Ariane, vai lá. Hi, Sharon. It's really nice to have you here with us. Uh, a question that I have is, uh, when you think about these emotions and how to express their in the, this in the clarinet, you think also which ways, in technique ways, I, uh, we can do that, or is only like I have the idea in my head and I try to express the, in the instrument? How you think about that? What do you mean? I, I was born with a clarinet in my mouth. It's just it's so natural. <laughs> I once um, had some of those crazy concerts with a lot, a lot of soloists and whatever. And uh, fan a fantastic mezzo-soprano, fantastic mezzo-soprano. We were sitting in the bar afterwards and drinking a whiskey and having a great time. And she said, oh, how, how does it, how do you just do it? You know, for me, it's all technique, technique, technique. And I just, I peed in my pants. I left because I wanted to ask her the same question. <laughs> of course, this is what we strive for, to sound as if we just do it. But it's a choreography of constant things that we do, technical things. Is it the tongue? Is it the finger? Is it the body? Is it the breath? It is all that stuff. And you have to find the choreography which is working on every read, in every situation, any kind of stress, and how to find these points that you can hold on to while your brain is doing pirouettes in the air. This and that and that and that and a thousand things. And it's not about writing it in the music. It's about having this choreography be part of the piece for you. And you lose it if you don't practice it for a year, but it comes back immediately if you really know a piece. In two, three days, the choreography is there again. Quick, really quick. But only if you really created a miraculous way of controlling everything in the piece. And of course, never everything, but striving to. And if you don't get something, to find out what was the problem and how could I solve it so it would always be there for me. And then you are free to make music, only then. So of course, it's all about, but you know, it's like a Sudoku, you know, every Sudoku is a new Sudoku. And the man, when, you, when you have it, you have it. So you, you, you never do the same one again. You have to make sure that it's solved for you, that the problem is solved. It's not a problem of legato from one note to the other. It's in a particular piece, when that note is before, in this dynamic, and the next note is coming in this constellation, Solve your problem so it's yours. And if you can, I mean, sometimes you have concerts where you stand there and say, yes, I got it. And sometimes you, there are concerts you stand there and say, ah, nothing works today. And the audience might not even really hear the difference, but it's your feeling whether you really were on top of your brain on that day or whether the brain just did the automated system, which is working too, but it doesn't really, 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 really work for you. You don't really feel like you controlled it. It's controlled by, yeah, the movement that you learned to do, but it's not yours. Yeah, that's how it is. Every day of my life since, my God, many years. Shh, not talk about it. Thank you. And Sharon, Laís is asking if um, when you think about singing with the clarinet, um, if it has something to do with imagination, if you um, practice the same, the scenes behind the playing? Um, not really um, a complete picture with green grass and a cow and uh, sunshine, and definitely not a complete text of saying blah, 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 particular, but definitely colors, um, sort of general emotions. And I think it's not so far away from a story, although it's not a story in words, you know, it's not a, um, a story which is 
pinned down to a particular place and a particular time, but it's definitely a, an emotional development which you are going through a piece. And it's, this is why music without words is different than music with words. It's much more abstract, but I definitely feel like I have some story there. And interestingly enough, some colleague of mine, which I love, a cellist, we were playing Brahms trio and we were playing the second movement of the trio and um, we played it many, many times and we had some rehearsal before the concert. And um, I say, ah, oh, and it's so beautiful to have such a spring day on a rainy winter day. And he looks at me and says, what spring? This is all autumn. It's all autumn. Can't you, can't you hear the autumn? Can't you feel the autumn? Brahms is always autumn. I said, what are you talking about? This is, this is so light and beautiful and, and sunny. And he says, well, let's not talk about it. It's not going to help. So we can have different stories and even play together and not realize. It's all about us having something that we can hold on to. And what comes out, that's whoever's listening to. It's not, not anymore our, our problem, but we need something to hold on in order to make a color, make a sound, create an atmosphere and a story. And, and Bruno Avoglia is asking if you look for inspirations in addition to the opera for these ideas of singing. I find inspiration mostly on, in my uh, colleagues. And my chamber music colleagues, if somebody is um, sending me something through their phrases, then I, I need to do something with it. So that's my inspiration when I'm actually performing, of course, practicing and trying to make an uh, interpretation. Sometimes inspiration comes from yourself. Of course, you don't have anybody around you when you're practicing on your own. And um, Sometimes it comes from the music, you just read and you say, oh my God, look, I, I, I didn't see this. this. This is something. And sometimes you do something wrong or bad or, or, or ugly and you say, how can I get rid of it? And then you have to really work around finding an inspiration to change your habit or to change your natural way of doing it, which is not beautiful for you. So I think it's about always having a conversation with yourself because sometimes <laughs> you mean one thing, but you sound different. And if you don't listen to yourself, then you're only on this side and you think it's, it's okay. And sometimes you start listening and you realize it's, it's not okay. So I need a different inspiration because what I am putting into the instrument is not coming back on the other side. And then you need to change. So that's, that's something that I, I try to work with. But um, I, I like to live life. I have children. I talk to them on the phone, to my parents. I'm a person person. I, I go and do my sports. I take a walk and I don't take a bag, fill it up and then put it on my rug in my practicing room and then look for inspiration. It doesn't work like that. But I think living life inspires you as a person altogether. And then it, it comes as part of who you are and it becomes part of, of your music. And you don't have to really work for it. You just have to open up and, and be honest. And, and then it comes, it comes out, should come out. But you have to be a little bit of an exhibitionist, no? Should I admit somebody new into the waiting room? Now I'm the boss. Here. No, 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 I, now you are co-host, <laughs> so I will stop it now. This is my job, okay? Renata, I'm you happy want to, to give it up, I told you. I'm really not very good at it. Renata, you have a question? Uh, seu microfone está desligado, Renata. I'm not hearing you. Google. Ah. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Wonderful explanations. Um, Thank you. I have a question. You talked about the relationship of singing, phrasing, and breathing with playing the clarinet. Nowadays, many clarinets play using continuous breathing, but the singers sing it beautiful and don't use that briefing. What can you say about that? Yes, this is exactly what I was talking about. I think this is a tool. This is something we must use because, you know, a normal person has to breathe all the time. And if you're sitting in a concert chair, just relaxed, you are realizing that the person on the stage is not breathing, not breathing for what is normal to you. 
And this is something that creates tension also by the listener because they're sitting there going <gasps> all the time. And when there's circular breathing happening, you have the noise of the noise, nose, you realize somebody is breathing or you are realizing the unnatural part of that. So it's also something to be very excited about, but you lose the excitement immediately because you're realizing, well, no problem anymore. So um, it's like somebody uh, not um, walking on air, but they have some little aeroplane. So they're not really walking on air, but if somebody is doing pirouettes and they don't have a machine helping them, that is something that is very exciting. So I really believe it's a, it's a pity in a way to use circular breathing in classical music where breathing is a tool to help you get the audience's respect and admiration. You get the respect mm -hmm. and the admiration by training your breath to be supernatural, not by breathing whenever you want. That's my opinion, but it's a, I don't think everybody shares this opinion. <laughs> I see. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Bruno Girardi, and he asked how important is the fine work of the fingering for the legato? How to practice this aspect? Okay, very, very important. Here, I have my clarinets here because my practicing room is too cold. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you can hear it. It's being used in modern music as a tool, percussion tool. So this disturbs the legato also because of the noise, but also because of the fact that we have uh, air going inside the clarinet. And if we're putting air quickly from above through the hole, through this hole, it's making boom and it Think about the nice snake of air. You make a boom, it goes. So there is no possible possibility for legato if you are putting air quickly into the clarinet from the side of the fingers. So of course you need to make sure that if you are playing slow, the fingers are moving slow and they're not making noises and they're not creating non-legato by moving the air. So Charlie Nydick always talks about two hands being one hand, like a pianist playing an arpeggio. It's not, it's always, yes, they're always moving from here and using all the fingers as one. And we should do the same thing with our clarinet. We should move all the fingers together. So that's the bottom finger is moving up before. Of course, you cannot do that in real time, yes? But the feeling should be as if you're closing all the holes one after the other when playing a legato. And of course, when you have a legato from one octave, it takes longer. And if you have a, a legato for one tone, it doesn't take so long. The feeling should be that you give your body the time to make the legato also with the fingers. And this is something we want to have control. So we go pack. Legato. We have to make legato, but actually you have to say, come legato, come to me. Yes, my baby, I love you. And it's very difficult to do with a clarinet if you really want to catch the note and it's difficult. Yes. And another thing to help with coming legato is if you are playing, I'm trying to be in the picture, you're playing from, from a, a low C to a high C. And of course the clarinet wants to run away. So if you go down with your body instead of up, in the knees, just to think like you are going down in the knees and that makes you not possible to actually have tension. If you're falling in the knees, you, you lose the tension in your upper body. So you're not going ta-da, you're going ta-da and then it's immediately there and singers do it all the time. They go into their knees to get the high tones, to look from down up and maybe even from up to down, but not to reach but to fall onto the note. And that is something that always helps me. If I have problems with the, catching the high notes, which is no finger problems because you just open your fingers. You cannot help with the fingers legato. You can help by going into your knees and just letting the note come. And then it's, it's easier than if you do something like this and then it's all stuck up there. And the hobby is asking about this work on contemporary music. 
about what work on contemporary music? This work with legato and imagination in contemporary music. Contemporary music. Okay. Well, uh, again, every, we, we cannot talk about romantic period or classical period when you talk about modern period because there are so many different things. But it's music. It's always music. So you have to find the way to express yourself through any piece, any composer, any kind of music. And if, of course, there is no legato in a modern piece, then there's no legato in it. But if there is legato, it should be treated like any legato and any other type of music. And you should look for the emotions. And since legato creates emotion, you can use this in order to create emotion and give it to your audiences. And if it's there in the music, definitely treat it as Schumann. Great. And I have another question. Um, before we start, uh, we, were, we were talking about um, these great times. I asked you about coming to Brazil and you talked about those complications of having a family, deciding to live in one place and um, working near home. And I would like to ask, uh, we are in a clar women clarinet festival. So I would like to ask about being a woman clarinetist. What do you feel about that? Have you ever had any problems, um, realized that you have any problems of being a woman while playing clarinet? Well, um, I grew up with a mother who worked always. So my mother, she, she uh, is a violist and she just retired from Israel Philharmonic and worked all her life. I always grew up with a working mother, a musician working mother, which means that she was always there in the afternoon because she had in the morning rehearsal and the evening concert. So uh, it was very comfortable life as a mother, of course not because she had the stress of playing a concert and you know, but it seemed to me like it was a good thing. And um, I come from a country where um, in Israel, all the women must work because there's no money at home if only the husbands work. So there's hardly any mothers who are not working. Then I came to Germany, well, I was in New York. In New York, people are people, you know, there's crazy people and there's normal people and there are rich people and poor people. So many people in New York, you don't think about who am I and am I different because everybody's different. And um, I wanted to have my career always. I mean, I was a very thick headed person. And I said uh, from the beginning, I want to be a clarinet soloist and this is what I want to do. And if it doesn't work, I go and study physics or something else, not clarinet, definitely not clarinet. And this was my idea. And, but I always in the back of my mind said, I, I, I'm a family person, so I must have a family too. And I think I never had problems with it only because I met very, I, you know, coincidence in life. I had a really the right person, people around me to push my career, but also in the most important time where I could lose reality and lose the ability to meet people, uh, to meet a husband, to make a family, to concentrate on this. I met my husband who totally was into me having my career without a doubt about we are in this together and we will make it happen. And I had parents who really were behind me saying, we will support and help for you to have your career and still have your family. So I had all the support around me. It was not just me juggling everything. I also left and my kids were home or I left and I took them with me with an au pair or I took them with me with my mother or my father. Um, so they always helped me. Um, make it possible. Every concert, every week, every month was a different issue, but it was always manageable. It was always possible. And I had enough craziness to make it happen, to practice and breastfeed and, uh, you know, and do all it at the same time, because it was as important to me to have my family as it was to be myself on a stage. But as I said, I never had a doubt that it's possible as a woman, but I always had the help. So if somebody does not have the help, I don't know how it's possible. 
It's very, very important to find the ring of help around you, the people around you who support you for who you are and not having to fight to be better than a man. Because if you have to fight and be better than a man, you'll never, never be able to do it if you want to have a child and another child and you are tired and you, and you have to constantly prove to the world, you know, uh, I don't need your help. I, I, I can be better than a man. I, I think that is not possible. You need to be able to say, okay, that's all I can do today. Please, you take it on. I can't. Or as I did when I was maybe end of 20, I said, all I can do is enlarge Europe. If I go outside of Europe and I try to do America and Japan and Korea and Brazil, I will not be able to have my life as a mother at all and, and my life as a clarinetist and keep my level. So not just practice and not just see my children and be on a stage, be honest to myself, how much can I achieve? And I said to myself, this is what I can achieve. I can achieve a career 3,000 kilometers around my house. <laughs> but I can, I can go to, to south of Italy or to Reykjavik, but I cannot go across the seas where I have jet lag and where I'm losing time running around the world and trying to show everybody how great I am. Because then at the end, I don't believe myself anymore. So that was it. And I think as a woman standing on a stage, we have a power that the men don't have because we are strong and we are um, beautiful and we are, every, all of us are beautiful and we are sexy and we are attracting the eyes and the ears. And if you have something to say, they're all listening to you, all. And the man, you know, you're expected to do it. But the woman, if she does it, then everybody's going like, wow, she does it and she's a woman. So we still have this possibility. Maybe in 20 years, we're all the same and then it doesn't matter anymore. Now we're not the same yet. And that's, for me, always been an advantage. I used it as an advantage, not as a disadvantage. But I must say, um, just one more thing. I gave a masterclass, as I said last week, I always am in Israel in October, always, giving masterclasses to children or to young adults. And this year, well, Corona, so it's not possible. And I haven't been there now for a year. So we made a masterclass on, on Zoom on, online. Um, a, a, a very great colleague helped and it was fantastic. Um, and after the masterclass, I said, so this is my email. You can write me if you'd like. And a, and, a, and a girl wrote and she asked, I don't have women models around me. I have only men figures around me. And I, I, I feel it's not so good. I never had that problem. So I hope for everybody to have themselves and their mothers and their colleagues as models around and not have to always look up to men. That is, I think, something that is, can be very depressing on a long, a long term. But we have each other, no? <laughs> Especially we have you today. So we are so happy. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from Bruno again, and we go back to the clarinet. Um, he says, an important aspect in the training of singers is the work with body expression as complementing the transmission of nuances. How do you see this parallel in the performance of a clarinet solist? The body, using yes. the body? Yes. 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 Um, well, I had the, the opposite problem. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> if you've seen me perform, but uh, if you look at YouTubes and you see some of the commentary, they're mostly about how I move, <laughs> not about how I play. So, but this is something that was always part of me and I had to be stopped. So I had a very wise teacher in the beginning, Eli, uh, Eli Iban, who is a very famous teacher now in America. Um, and he always said, don't move, don't move and put me against the wall. But actually what we try to find out is which movement are positively working on your expression and which are, are problematic, which are getting in the way of making music. And that is something that one must find out for themselves. Which movement can I do to help my instrument and myself express what I want? And which movement should I not do if it's not helping me? Yes, something like this or, yeah, things that are stopping my instrument from being able to have the flow of the music we should not do. And of course, this can be helped by standing in front of a mirror. And it's something that 
you have to do at some point of your life. You have to stop doing it at some point of my life because I, I can get sick of watching myself play. So I maybe shouldn't because it's working. So I maybe should quit look, looking now for problems. But in the stage of development, it's very important to get to know yourself. Also the bad things, not just the good things and find the things that you are doing with the body that are not helping you. And also, of course, as I was talking about breathing, you are creating emotions with your body. So the breathing is also an emotion. If you breathe quickly, you are creating attention of a moment. If you're breathing slowly, you are creating a beautiful moment maybe. And of course, if you don't do this with your body, then you are disturbing. If you're making legato and you're moving all the time like this, then the audience kept getting two messages, one from what they hear and one from what they see. So you have to try and create the emotion also in the whole of your body. And sometimes you really need to, to have somebody watch yourself from outside, have a video of yourself, have a teacher, a friend, a colleague say, stop moving like this. It's making me you know, nervous. And you say, what, what am I doing? And they say, you, you're moving. Oh, no, I didn't realize. And then you start realizing what you are doing and then you can stop it. And then you can create a new way for you to express yourself. And then you don't have to think about it anymore. It's natural for yourself, like everything else. I have a question. Um, hi, uh, congratulations. Hi. Thank you very much for your explanation about uh, voice, the connections between uh, instruments and voice. I'm, I'm a violist, and uh, I, I am, violist. <laughs> yeah, um, I, of course, I know about your brother and uh, uh, in your uh, CD with the the piano trio with, with clarinet. Beautiful, thank you. Um, and um, I'm. Actually, this subject is not old fashioned. Uh, the, the link with the voice and uh, um, thank you to talk about that. And um, I would like to insist a little bit about the, what do you think uh, about this connection with uh, contemporary music or extended techniques and uh, what were uh, what are the aspects that you think in a voice with uh, this this kind of music or style? And um, extending a little bit the question, uh, do you think that um, this relationship with the voice can be uh, made with any type of music or uh, any style and uh, from any time? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you're working also with singers, um, we did yeah, now Piero Lunea, and uh, that's one type of uh, music. I played a lot of Penderecki, that is also old fashioned, or Lotuslavski. Um, but then you come and you play Stockhausen, and it's a different story. Or if you play uh, um, very modern things, I, I, I played a new concerto in January and uh, there was a lot of, of screaming and loud and loud, but still this is for me, a piece of music which does not come from there is not interesting most of the time. So you have to find out your connection to a piece, right? I mean, you have to still speak. If somebody is standing on a stage and going, blah, 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 blah. yeah, after a while you say, well, very interesting, but goodbye. I, yeah, I, I understand, you know, but it's not you, it's the person but uh, who wrote it, but I don't have my interest with it. And how often have we all sat in a concert and you know how difficult it is and you're really saying, wow, you know, this instrumentalist really, really killed this piece but you don't take anything home with you, right? So of course, this is all experimental and part of what our mission in life is, is to actually give all these composers a voice. But if you are working with a composer, try to animate them to create something that you can actually react to. And to be able to react to it, you need to have something to hold on to. And I think also these expression ways from our old traditional classical music 
is something to hold on to. I mean, you can't write a book without using words. So it can be modern literature, but it must use words. So you have to use somehow the techniques of notes on a piece of paper or whatever, right? So some of these techniques have to include our old fashioned techniques. And of course, it's not just playing the notes. If you just play the notes, your audience will be bored. They will not listen to you. After a few minutes, they will say, okay, what is next on the piece? And unfortunately, yes, it's the first piece. If it was after the symphony, I would already leave the hall. And if it's an interesting piece or if the musician who is performing it finds a way to make it interesting for you in some way, then you listen and you say, maybe it was not my favorite piece, but you know, I, I, I understood a little bit. I took something with me. And we must use this way to create emotions, even if in a, if in a, in a modern piece that is you know, new to you and maybe works differently, but still find things that connect to you. And it's always about back to singing. It's back to normal um, expressing yourself as we do by talking with the hands and with the voice and with the changing the height, it must have some connection to real life. Otherwise it probably will not interest anybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Sid. The, the next question, it's a complicated question. I, I tried to, to, to translate, I'm not sure. So um, Graziella asked, you are aware of the privileges you had from the, and the privileges because of the support you had from family, you have already said. So do you see yourself as feminist? Well, you know, I, mu I must really be honest that until uh, I was asked some probably many years ago to come to um, Vienna and have a symposium uh, about women in music. So the idea was to have um, composer, women composers compose for women clarinetists in Vienna and have a woman giving the masterclass. And my first reaction was, are you crazy? <clears throat> no, what, what, what do you mean women? And the, the man who organized it, we talked a lot on the phone and he said, you know, this is a real issue because if you look back into the history of music, um, there are some very famous women performers, even Clara Schumann, and, but then it starts to be a very, very open field. No composer women, hardly ever. Conductors, forget it. And even orchestras didn't have women. So we're talking about not so long ago. And now you just stand there saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It does matter. We in Austria don't have many women professors and we want to create a new generation. It's not because we don't allow it. It's because nobody wants. And we want to create a new generation to say, hey, we can do it. We can do anything. And the only way to do it is to be a, 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 a to be there for them, to, to be a, a, a woman standing there saying, why not? Yeah, Not I did it because I'm superwoman, but it's normal. This is what women can do, just be there. And I said, okay, okay, I'll come. And it was of course really, really great. It was fun and, and funny. And of course there were men too and clarinet men too, but the composers, the, the, the three women who were composing were just women. And that was part of the idea. And uh, it was difficult to find three women <laughs> that will compose, but, but they found. And after that, I started, you know, sort of listening for, for this issue. And um, my daughter is a complete feminist, much more than me. Um, and really, really uh, into this thing. And she opened my eyes to a lot of things because I have one son and then two daughters. And she said, mom, you raised him different than me. I said, what do you mean I raised him different than you? He said, yes, you never came and picked him up from the corner when he came back from, from the, the, the train. And I always had to call you and say, I'm at the corner, come and get me. You, you taught me to be afraid to walk in the dark as a woman. Why didn't he have to? Well, my son is almost two meters big. <laughs> I don't think anybody would screw with him. He's just big. But she's right. Even if he was his, her height, 
I would not be afraid for him. But since I grew up in this, it seems normal to me. And she says, no, it's not normal. It should not be normal. So I'm starting to be more of a feminist or to have the new generation open my eyes to things that for me seemed normal and even abnormal to the fact that I have a husband who's 100% the mother of the house when I am gone. And he is the better cook of the house. And he's totally mom and dad when I am gone. And I'm totally mom and dad when he goes, which is normal, right? I mean, it's normal that the, the, the boys work and the girls are home, but it's not at that time was not normal. So I am trying to, to, to try to see that I actually should have asked for more because I felt like I was very lucky. And now I'm starting to think about I was lucky, but not everybody around me. And I should have made done more to, to create this possibility for, for others around. And I see the difference because I have a 23-year-old boy and a 12-year-old, almost 12-year-old girl. And I see the difference in society in Germany today between those two periods. All the mothers are working in my daughter's class. And none of the mothers were working in my son's class. So times are changing and I'm very happy about it. I'm very proud about it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are almost done with the time. Um, se mais alguém tem vontade de perguntar mais alguma coisa, a gente já meio que passou um pouquinho do tempo, só para a gente poder encerrar, se alguém tiver uma última pergunta, talvez aí né, relacionada com, com o tema do encontro, alguém mais, se alguém quiser abrir o microfone. No more questions? <laughs> yes, I'm sure. So, Cheryl, One thank more. you. So, ah, uh, yes. So, yes, we have. The violist again. <laughs> um, uh, would you uh, sum up the subject, the relationship between voice and instruments uh, with one, the most important aspect to, to in instrumentalists to think about the voice? Yes, um, the search to sound as if it's natural. And that is what we are looking for, just like the circus animators walking on, you know, high strings and doing things with their body, which are impossible for us, but possible for them and seem like they can do it forever. This is what we have to do. We have to create the wow effect. And the creation of the wow effect is being able to control our instrument to such an extent that it sounds like we can just do it and we're not working at all. And that is something that I strive for, to try just to play the clarinet. You put it in your mouth and you play and people who are listening to me, they're not asking, can she do that? Can she do that? They just think that I can do everything. They believe me that I can do everything and that every word that I say is the truth. And this is something to strive for. And the technique is a secondary thing. The technique should bring you to this point. So practicing the technique for being able to play fast should stop. It just should get out of this world. It should not be part of, that is not what we are about. We are about creating beauty and, and this beauty must be in the most important po point of our existence and not the technique behind it. Okay. All right. It's nice to finish with those beautiful words. So um, I have already said, but I'm going to repeat how grateful we are with this opportunity to have you here in this afternoon with us. Um, as I said, we are living those crazy times, but they also gave us this gift, that is opportunity <laughs> to bring you to Brazil. So I don't have to, but, but I, I'm still waiting for the next eight years you are going to come. I know that. So we are going to, to meet us in person. Very soon. Definitely. <laughs> okay. So maybe before when you come to Germany. So yes, I, 
I, I hope I, I go in December. I, I, I'm not sure. So I, I would like to, to ask everybody, if I will say in Portuguese, but before in English, because then you can understand. I'd like to ask everybody to open the camera, then we can make a photo with everybody. Agora sim, em português, claro. Gente, vamos abrir as câmeras <risos> para a gente poder fazer uma foto com todo mundo. Vou mudar aqui a... a... Se vocês quiserem <risos> abrir os microfones... Oh, all the faces! Yes, hi everybody! Nice to meet you! <risos> vocês quiserem abrir o microfone para aplaudir, agradecer. Uh! Obrigada! Yeah. Yeah. Brava! Thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, ah, que foi? lindo! Hi! Que lindo! Yes, we were all here. I shouldn't have said anything, now he's gone. Ah, there you are. <laughs>